All right, well, I have three o'clock, so let's get started. Hello, and welcome to the post-fire webinar series. My name is Carrie Berger, and I'm the manager of Oregon State University's Extension Fire Program. Some of you may already know, but for others that don't, the fire program is a new program in forestry and natural resources extension. Right now, the, the fire team and our extension foresters have been focusing on assisting with post-fire efforts, but moving forward, we'll work to facilitate landscape scale cross-boundary management projects on the ground and continue, of course, to provide education and outreach to all Oregonians. Much like our forestry and natural resource extension colleagues, the fire program team will be living and working in communities throughout Oregon. For this post-fire webinar series, we will focus on impacts to forestry and natural resources on your property. For example, impacts to water, soil, and vegetation. During the first webinar in this post-fire series, we heard from Extension and agency partners about an after-the-fire checklist, which helps you to chart a course forward. That checklist is available online to download and also as a fillable form, which you can fill out right from your smartphone. In addition to the checklist, the presenters recommended that you take photos and you connect with your local resources and contacts. Then on October 8th, we learned about hazard tree assessment and burn severity and erosion. And last week, we learned about assessing post-fire survivability of trees and potential for salvage logging. Information about these webinars can be found on the FIRE program website, and the recordings can be found on the Forestry and Natural Resource Extension YouTube channel. My co-host, Tiffany Hopkins, is adding these links in the chat box and I will also provide resources to you in a follow-up email. I want to thank Tiffany for helping me co-host this webinar today. Tiffany is the coordinator for two forestry and natural resource extension programs, including the Women Owning Woodlands Network and Master Woodland Manager. Thank you, Tiffany. So let me see here if I can switch the screen. One of our partners, Jason Pettigrew, who is a stewardship forester for the Klamath Lake District and also serves as an operations section chief with Oregon Department of Forestry's incident management teams, shared this photo with me today. And, you know, I felt compelled to share with you all as well. This is what Jason had to say about the photo. The burnt American flag symbolizes to him that Oregonians, Americans, stood strong through these events, weathered the firestorm and took care of each other to do what they could despite taking some da damage. He saw several other firefighters take a pause and a moment of silence at this location when they got back to work and then they got back to work to protect what homes and land still was threatened by the fire. This photo is a powerful image of the summer's event and also reminds him of similar images of the Twin Towers, Hiroshima, and Im other images in our American history, where we as Americans have stood strong through some tough times and rebuilt from the ashes. He appreciates this image because of what we stand for and how our flag still stands despite the tough times that come our way. Thank you for sharing, Jason. We are Oregonians, we are resilient, and we are strong. Thank you for being on the line with us today. So I have to go over some webinar logistics before we begin. Let's see here if I can advance my slide. This session is being recorded and all the webinar recordings can be found on our Forestry and Natural Resource Extension YouTube channel. We are also streaming live on the Extension's Facebook page. For you all in the webinar, your audio has been muted. If you're having audio troubles and are connected to your computer's audio, I suggest hanging up and dialing in with your phone. You can always post a question in the chat window if you're having technical difficulties. Tiffany will be monitoring that chat window and can help you out. Thanks again, Tiffany. If you have a question on the information that is being presented, um, please type that question into the Q&A box 
And there you go, that's where you can find it. We plan to pause several times throughout today's webinar for a question and answer session with our presenters and panelists. And then let's just see here. Finally, as you can see up top here, you can adjust how you view the presenters by going to the upper right corner of your screen. You might choose to see all presenters at once or just the person who is actually speaking. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. So we have a lot of presenters and panelists with us on the line today. And so I'll just give a brief introduction, starting with Max Bennett and Glenn Ahrens, who are both with Oregon State University Forestry and Natural Resource Extension Program. We also have Keith Baldwin and Nate Agelsoff from the Oregon Department of Forestry. From the Oregon Department of Agriculture, we have Kevin Fenn with us. And then Heather Medina is joining us from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And from the Farm Service, we have Brett Harris on the line. Thank you all for being here today. So if you don't catch all the information presented, don't worry. I'll provide all the resources mentioned during this webinar on our FIRE program website on the webinar class webpage. And I'll even follow up, like I said earlier, with an email just to be sure that you get the information. Okay, let's get started. Max, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Unmute myself here. Uh, hang on just a second. Let's see. There we go. So are you seeing the agenda on the screen here, Carrie? I sure am. Looks great, Max. Okay, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to be here today. Um, what we hope to do is provide you with something of a, of a 10,000 foot view of reforestation after wildfire. You know, there's no way that we can cover everything that you would need to know in a reforestation operation, but we want to talk about some of the key considerations, some of the pinch points, some of the major questions that you might ask, and some of the issues that you would consider to help you make decisions about how to reforest, whether to reforest, and how to go about it. So our agenda for today is we'll start off with a quick post-fire revegetation overview that I'll provide. Uh, then Keith Baldwin with the Oregon Department of Forestry will be talking about Forest Practice Act requirements and some issues around that. And then we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, then following that, uh, Glenn will come on and he'll be talking about sort of the nuts and bolts of reforestation after fire, but again, kind of from that 10,000 foot view. And we'll have another Q&A session following Glenn's presentation. Then we will hear from our agency partners, Brett Harris with the Farm Service Agency. He'll be talking about the Emergency Forest Restoration Program, if I got that right, and other services that FSA may have. And then Heather Medina will be talking about some of the NRCS's post-fire programs. And then following their presentations, we will have another Q&A session. And, and throughout, Carrie, <laughs> Carrie will be uh, keeping us all on track uh, on time. So I'm going to go ahead and launch into my presentation here. Uh, again, I'm going to be giving a, a bit of a post-fire uh, revegetation overview and just sort of by way of introduction about myself, uh, I am the forestry and natural resources agent down here in southwestern Oregon. I cover Jackson and Josephine counties. I've been here for over 20 years and in that 20 years we have had many, many fires and so the other day I decided I'd total up how many acres it's been over that span. It's been over a million acres. So I have had a chance in this position to work with a number of landowners who have uh, experienced wildfire in their properties and have had to figure out what to do. And I've also had a chance to see a lot of burned areas and see how they recover over time. And these experiences will be informing uh, the material that I'm gonna be presenting uh, to you this afternoon. Just kind of on a personal level, uh, I live in Phoenix, Oregon, and of course in, in my area we had the devastating Almeda fire, which burned uh, literally thousands of houses and dwellings. 
uh, we were evacuated. It's, it's, it's been really a devastating experience for our community. Fortunately, uh, our house did not burn, but it was a close call. And we, we just feel extremely fortunate. And also it's, it's been heartening to see how the community has come together, both devastating and at the same time heartening to see how people have come together to respond to this, to this catastrophe. So what I'm gonna focus on this afternoon really is kind of the big picture considerations to help you decide what you might wanna do in the way of reforestation. So I'm gonna start off by talking about post-fire regrowth of vegetation. You know, what would happen, what will happen after a fire if you don't do anything? And I'll just show you some examples of that. Then I'll be talking about natural regeneration of trees, focusing on conifers, and with those two topics in mind, I'll finish up by giving you a sense of some broad reforestation options after fire, ranging from just letting nature take its course to salvage and replanting. Okay, so you may be in this kind of a position where you're looking out at a bl uh, blackened landscape, your property and other burned areas in your vicinity and wondering, you know, what's going to come back? Uh, how fast will it come back? What, what's going to happen? And of course, there are many variables that, that determine post-fire vegetative recovery, things like what kind of vegetation is already on the site, What's the climate after fire? And, and one of the big factors, one of the key factors is fire severity. So in previous webinars in this series, you've heard about a range of fire severities that we, we often see in fires from low severity to high severity. And what I'm gonna do is show you several examples of vegetation recovery after fires along that gradient of severities. I guess I should add that I'm talking here about vegetation burn severity, not soil burn severity. So uh, just to make that distinction again, that's been made in previous webinars, you might have a landscape that has experienced high severity fire in terms of vegetation. That is many or most of the trees have been killed, but the soil burn severity isn't necessarily all that high. Okay, so we're going to look at some low severity fire. This is a Douglas fir forest that has experienced low severity fire. The trunks of the Douglas fir trees are scorched. Looks like there's some big leaf maple in here. So maybe some of those trees, uh, because they have thin bark, have been killed, have been top killed, but they will likely re-sprout fairly quickly after the fire. So impacts from this pretty low, no real need to be concerned about reforestation. Here's another example of a low severity fire. This is in a different forest, uh, Douglas fir forest, a little bit higher elevation. And this is several years after the fire. So it's pretty hard to tell, except for the scorch marks on the Douglas fir trees, it's pretty hard to tell there was a fire here uh, several years afterwards. So again, uh, there, though there aren't hardwoods in this example, you'll generally see that the hardwoods will resprout from the base. Because soil is such a good insulator, many of the shrub species, the forbs and grasses, uh, will also regenerate from below ground. So from roots, from rhizomes, and from other below ground organs. So, and so a little bit of botanical terminology here. A forb is a herbaceous plant that's not grass, so something like a wildflower, and a rhizome is an underground stem. So again, in this example of low severity fire, little impact and very rapid recovery. So moving to the opposite end of the spectrum, this is a high severity fire. This is the Oregon Gulch fire from 2016. This was right on the border of Oregon and California. And so we're visiting the fire, oh, three or four weeks afterwards. And, you know, most of the overstory trees were killed, pretty, pretty severe fire, but already you can see the re-sprouting of these hardwoods. So here's one, here's an Oregon grape, same fire, here's an Oregon ash. So again, very commonly, 
the hardwoods will re-sprout from the base from root crowns. Oops. Here's another example. This is more of a moderate severity fire, a moderate, moderate to high severity fire. So this is 10 years after the fire. There, there has not been any management in this situation. In fact, this is a wilderness area or on the border of a wilderness area. So uh, it was pretty black and bare right after the fire. And now it's, it's pretty jungle-like. Uh, some plants have re-sprouted. There are some ferns, there are some shrubs in there but a lot of them have regenerated from seed that has blown into the site. And so in this picture, you can see some pink flowered uh, plants, though that's fireweed. That's a very common uh, wildflower that will yeah, come into burned areas. There's also some sugar pine seedlings that have regenerated from seed. You can see some, the adjacent uh, timber stand over there that was probably the seed source. So um, right after the fire, there's a nice mineral soil seed bed. So you typically get a lot of regeneration of, of many different species. Another thing to point out here is the, this is about a decade after fire, the trees that were killed are starting to fall down. So that's, that's kind of a, a potential fuels issue down, down the road. Here's another uh, situation after a high severity fire. And in this case, there were seeds stored in the soil. We call it the soil seed bank. And these are seeds from snowbrush ceanothus, which can actually live, uh, the seeds can remain viable in the soil for decades, even centuries. And when there is a high severity event, the seed is scarified and in that, very favorable post-fire environment of mineral soil, the seed germinates and you get this brush field. And so this is another common eventuality after high severity fire. Here is an example of a high severity wildfire patch. This is 10 years after the fire. And from a diversity and habitat standpoint, this is really, a, this was a pretty impressive place. There were, I just remember walking through here, there were so many uh, cavity nesting birds flitting about above, uh, a lot of bees and other pollinators. You can see there was a lot of forage for deer and elk. So uh, from a habitat standpoint, a very uh, rich environment, but obviously from a timber standpoint, um, it's a different story. One of the things to consider with moderate to high severity fires is potential for noxious weed invasion. So uh, this, is, this is Scotch broom, of course, and this is not actually after a fire, but uh, many of you are familiar with Scotch broom and other noxious weeds. And if you have seed sources near your property or on your property, uh, after fire, especially after this high severity fire, you have this mineral soil seed bed. So it's really an excellent ground for invasion and spread of these noxious weeds. So that's something you really probably need to be alert to and be ready to respond pretty quickly so you don't get a major infestation. All right, so to summarize the sort of post-fire revegetation, you're typically going to see grasses, forbs, shrubs, hardwood retrieves uh, coming back on their own, usually relatively quickly, even after a high severity fire. Conifer regeneration may be more variable, it's typically more variable. So there could be none or spotty, or it could be abundant. In this uh, particular example that we're looking at here, this is a high severity burn patch. You can see um, some shrubs. Those are probably big, big leaf maple sprout clumps, but not much in this particular case in the way of natural conifer regeneration. They'll probably return to this site, but it's likely to take many years. So let's talk now a little bit about natural regeneration of conifers after fire and, and what it takes for that to happen. So you need seed, of course, and that comes from seed trees, and we'll talk more about seed trees in a second. The seed needs to fall on a favorable seed bed, 
And the mineral soil that you find after fire is, is a pretty ideal seedbed for a lot of different species. Uh, not too much competition from other vegetation that's established there and a favorable microclimate, often a little bit of shade for those, for those young seedlings. So let's talk a little bit about seed trees. The ideal seed tree is a large, uh, mature, vigorous tree that is producing a lot of seed, like these ponderosa pine, uh, mature ponderosa pine. You can see all of the uh, seedlings and saplings in the understory. Most conifer seed, or all conifer seed, is wind dispersed. And so this chart on the upper right shows the dispersal distances for various species. So ranging from sugar pine on the left of that bottom axis, uh, axis to uh, western hemlock on the right. And then on the vertical axis is tree height. So what this is showing, the small ovals are from a slower wind, five miles an hour, and the larger ovals are for a 10 mile an hour wind. And basically it's showing you the seed dispersal distance for those species. And so the bottom line is most of the seed uh, from seed trees is gonna fall within a few hundred feet of those trees. So if you have really large burn patches with no, uh, with no seed trees, it's gonna take a while for those to regenerate. Another factor is the uh, periodicity of seed crops. So most species do not produce large seed crops every year, uh, with maybe the exception of lodgepole pine. And so for Douglas fir, for example, may not have uh, large seed crops every, uh, 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 may have as much as a decade between, between large seed crops. So, um, all those factors have to align for good natural regeneration. So you need the seed, seed trees that are nearby, you need a good seed crop, you need a receptive seed bed, and bare mineral soil is best for most conifers. Not too much competition. So if the site's already occupied by, brush or, by grass or brush, it's gonna be harder to get seedlings established and you need a favorable microclimate. And often that means a little bit of shade from some nearby overstory trees help those seedlings get through the first couple of summers. So if any of these factors are not present, for example, they're all there, but it's not a good seed year, then regeneration may not be very good. And so in this particular image that we're looking at, you have great natural regeneration, but a couple hundred yards away, it's, it's kind of spotty. In the early history of forestry in Oregon, folks relied primarily on natural regeneration, but since the 1950s or 1960s, we've gone to planting because it's so much more reliable. Okay, so now we'll kind of wrap up by talking briefly about some reforestation approaches, ranging from letting nature take its course on one end of the scale to planting with or without salvage uh, on the other end of the scale. And so what is suitable for you is gonna depend on your objectives. It's gonna depend on the desired condition you have for your forest. It's also gonna depend on practical considerations, things like how accessible the stand is, cost of doing it, seedling availability. You'll hear, you'll hear plenty about that uh, later on today. Uh, any sort of uh, Forest Practices Act requirements and you may use different approaches on different parts of your property. So you might have a remote area that you're just hard to get to. Uh, you just let nature take its course and come back as it will. And maybe another area where you have some merchantable trees and good access, you can do some salvage and planting. So I'm gonna talk about each one of these options uh, briefly here in the next few slides. So nature taking its course, Again, vegetation is likely to come back. It will come back. It may not be exactly what you want, uh, but this option is pretty good for habitat and diversity objectives. You have that early cereal vegetation uh, with a lot of biodiversity. Uh, this can be good for sites that are harder to access or a little bit more remote. Um, but there may be some issues around reforestation requirements and property tax implications, and I will let our next speaker uh, address those. 
Another option is to encourage natural regeneration, maybe with a little bit of interplanting. So this is a good option for landowners who have a mix of objectives. Maybe you're interested in habitat and also timber production. Uh, this is good for sites where you have moderate severity fire or maybe smaller patches of high severity fire where you have uh, sea trees nearby. Uh, but this is not just a stand back and let it happen option. You're gonna have to do some management, possibly of the seed bed, uh, possibly of competing vegetation to release those trees. And you may need to do some planting in areas where natural regeneration is not successful. You're likely to have longer time frames to get trees established and it just isn't as reliable of, of an option. If you do salvage prior to doing natural regeneration, you're going to have to develop an alternate plan for Oregon Department of Forestry. And then on the active end of the scale, you could do replanting with or without salvage. So this is gonna be the most reliable and fastest method of getting trees established. You have more control over composition and genetics. Uh, still a good option for multiple objectives, but if, if timber is your uh, high on your priority list, this is probably what you're gonna be focusing on. And of course, if you do salvage, you're going to have to reforest by law. So these examples that we hear, see here on the screen, the one on the left is uh, replanting without salvage. You can see the standing dead trees, all pretty small, so really no merchantable material. And this is a couple of years after planting. So the brush uh, that I mentioned, uh, probably from stored uh, seed in the soil has regenerated and will probably need to be controlled in order to make this planting successful. Then on the right here, we have an example also of replanting with no salvage and the idea of just getting the trees in as soon as possible. That's of course, depending on seedling availability before the competing vegetation gets established. And then this example is one of replanting with salvage. You can see there are some leaf trees, there are some snags, and you can see the yellow plastic tubes. Those are the Bexar tubes representing uh, seedlings that are being protected from browse damage. So those are some examples of options. And I'll just leave you with some things to consider in doing an assessment of what you want to do for reforestation. So you might want to be thinking about the severity of the fire and the size of the burn patches. You might want to think about the potential for natural regeneration of conifers and for the passive recovery of all vegetation as we've discussed. You want to think about, do we have any noxious weed patches nearby and what's the potential for spread? And also things like the ease of access for salvage, site prep, and planting. And then of course, probably first and foremost, what are your objectives? What do you, what do you really want? So I think with that, I'm going to stop and I'm gonna turn it over to Keith. So thank you. Thank you, Max. And Keith, whenever you're ready, um, do, do we need to stop sharing your screen, Max? There you go, great. Okay. All right, do you have the correct screen, Carrie? I don't, you need to switch the display from the notes to the, um, to the other view. There you go, there go. looks great, Keith. All right. I'm Keith Baldwin. I'm the Forest Practices Field Coordinator for the Department of Forestry. I want to thank you for participating today in the webinar and thank you to OSU Forestry Extension for putting this on. My job is to provide technical support for 51 stewardship foresters statewide. A little bit of history in reforestation after harvest was addressed in the 1941 Oregon Forest Conservation Act. And the key word there is addressed. And in 1971, Oregon adopted the Oregon Forest Practices Act for protection of soil, air, water, fish, and wildlife 
and public safety as well as other forest resources. But in the act, it required reforestation after harvest whenever remaining tree stocking was below the minimum site productivity level. So the Department of Forestry has the 51 stewardship foresters that can provide technical assistance to landowners to achieve reforestation. There are two resources that will be available by Kerry. The, uh, the one is a newsprint on the rules and then an illustrated manual of those rules. So the uh, savage operations will gener generally require reforestation and possibly revegetation when the remaining tree stocking is below the minimum site productivity standard. There are several options available to landowners, which I'll cover in this presentation. The important thing to know is it's the landowner's responsibility for reforestation. And that goes with the land when it's uh, possibly sold to someone else. It's very important that prior to the salvage that you consider these options. Just like Max had shared previously about seed trees, if you want to harvest, if you plan to harvest all the green trees, it's not going to lay, present you a very good option for natural regeneration or natural forestation. So there's this tool that uh, is called the Plan for an Alternate Practice. And what it does, it provides the stewardship forester an opportunity on a site specific basis to modify the reforestation rules which be, can be for tree species or trees per acre. We generally see that on the east side of the mountains. Uh, it's needed for natural regeneration after salvage, a wildlife food plot. I will go over that here. The reforestation rules can be temporarily suspended so a landowner becomes eligible for forest financial incentive programs. And this happens when the reforestation uh, this happens when the revenues from the salvage exceed the reforestation costs to, for the replanting. So that's an important thing to uh, open up a new door for financial assistance. And the reforestation rules can be exempt for conversion of forest land when their growing trees is not compatible with the new use. So I'm going to go over these different options that we earlier had identified. And this is a summary of the rules. And um, the rules are very lengthy. So this is just a kind of a high level look. And the landowner can use their plan or use a plan for an alternate practice. It has to be approved by the, the stewardship forester. The site, we're looking at trees that are uh, ecologically suited for the site, uh, meaning the, the seed zone elevation, and the species. The trees per acre is requirement is based on site productivity. And there's several, there's like six uh, site classes. They've been lumped into th three categories for trees per acre. The higher site classes require more trees per acre than the lower sites. Generally, the fires that have happened this year on the west side of the mountains are, would be requiring uh, 200 trees per acre. But your stewardship forester would be the one that would, would define that specifically for your site. The time to complete the plant or seeding is uh, first you have to do the site preparation and generally the sites are well prepared but if you're salvage logging that means there'll be some slash that will need to be either scattered or uh, piled. Uh, the tree should be ordered uh, within 12 months. This just shows that you're making effort to do the planting. Within two years or 24 months, the trees should be in the ground. There's an uh, exception. Uh, if you're within the scenic highway, you need to do that within 12 months. The time to establish a free grow stand uh, is six full calendar years. And what we mean by free to grow is that the trees are acceptable by species. They're well distributed by trees per acre, healthy and above the brush. So generally, this means there'll be, uh, in this span of time, you may need to do some management of the competing vegetation. There is an opportunity for an extension of time to meet the reforestation requirements. If after reasonable effort, there's circumstances that are beyond a landowner's control. And that could be like a nursery failure, 
and probably in this case for the next few years is the availability of seedlings and even planters. Natural regeneration is another option. It requires a plan for alternate practice be submitted 12 months after the salvage and approved by the stewardship forester. Again, we're looking at the site for acceptable tree species, and this is key that there are acceptable seed sources, either within the stand that's been harvested or adjacent stands that would provide a seed source for winds. Same trees per acre requirement based on site class. The time to complete the reforestation you know, may include again site preparation, may include some interplanting to get the stocking up. And there's a little bit more time. We're looking at like five years to get the, the new forest set to go. And then the time for full establishment for the trees to be totally on their own as free to grow would be nine years. So this is an extended time. Um, again, acceptable trees, well distributed, healthy above brush. An extension of time can be provided or approved after a reasonable effort and there's circumstances beyond the landowner's control. And this is where the poor cone crop or the periodic nature of cone crops, uh, particularly with the dug fir, um, it could be a gap year that, uh, that just aren't there to provide the seed source. So this is again where this, the interplanting is, is key here. Don't I would uh, imagine most of these uh, requests for natural reforestation is going to have a condition that there's interplanting and not totally waiting for natural regeneration to happen. Wildlife food plot, this is a new program. It's, uh, I mentioned it here just as an option. It's part of our reforestation uh, uh, toolkit. It's land that requires reforestation, but there's a choice to manage for wildlife. The ownership is limited. It has to be at least 10 acres and no more than 5,000 acres. And then a percentage of that ownership can be allowed in a wildlife food plot. So the more acres you have in ownership, the larger that food plot could be. The food plot could be several smaller plots, not necessarily aggregated. The time to complete it is it's key that this uh, effort is planting vegetation that substantially contributes to wildlife nutrition. So it's not a cut the trees and do nothing, but you're actually actively uh, establishing uh, plant material or conditions that would attract your target wildlife species. So again, reasonable effort needs to be pro uh, to this uh, wildlife food plot establishment within 12 months and then completed within 24 months. So there's a no free to grow kind of a condition like there is for a typical seedling establishment. The wildlife food plot needs to be maintained indefinitely or it needs to be reforested to the forest practices standards. A reasonable, forest, a reasonable effort can, um, once it's been made, there couldn't be an extension if there's some uh, issues like a drought or uh, wildfires. Forest land conversion, this is an option. Um, there's nothing in the Forest Practices Act that prevents forest land conversion. It's a little more complex though. There's uh, again, an alternate plan that needs to be approved. This time it needs county assessor and planner review and approval. And other agencies are likely going to be involved that will either review or approve that activity. What's essentially happening here is that the Forest Practices Act for resource protection is handing that over to another agency to ensure resource protection is being continued. So the site that would be approved for a forest conversion would be the smallest area where forest trees are incompatible to other uses, such as pasture, agriculture, a home site and wildlife habitat conservation. This is a program that I'll talk about later. Uh, it's similar to forest, uh, forest land deferral. The time complete is there is a requirement to revegetate sites to stabilize soil within 12 months. 
months. And typically this is done through natural establishment of trees, shrubs, and grasses, but it could be done by planting in order to prevent soil erosion. So uh, this needs, the conversion needs to begin within 12 months after salvage and the conversion needs to be um, completed by, well, begin in 12 months, completed by 24 months. And it needs to be maintained for six years after the harvest. And then that's when the Forest Practices Act uh, jurisdiction totally walks away. A reasonable effort uh, has been made by the landowner, but there's some circumstances that may be under control, uh, like a government delay in, in the initial review. So those extension can be granted here as well. As with any effort, there's always uncertainties. And so if there is no salvage, there is this uncertainty about the county forest land tax deferral. In this case, this is one of the questions that someone posed. What do they do with a 15 year old stand? It's uh, well stocked, but there's no salvage. And uh, we're on some tours uh, the last few weeks with, on warehouser land, and they have situations like this as well. And they're planning to plant through it, and they're not going to do any kind of um, uh, slash treatment or stand manipulation. So um, the cost to treat that would be uh, quite high. But the question here is, uh, under the Forest Practice Act, there's no requirement to plant, but the county may, uh, and if the Department of Revenue may interpret the laws requiring planting to get the forest tax deferral. Uh, as we understand at this point, they're not going to uh, pursue this at this moment in time. They realize there's a lot of issues with availability of seedlings and planters. So there's a pause there, but the interpretation is probably more important. What will be the final outcome there? The, the concerns about planting and seeds, uh, are there gonna be available seedlings and even planters to, to do the work? And even now, some of the industrial landowners are asking for extensions of time for several years. And we do that a case, on a case-by-case -case basis, but uh, there's going to be some challenges there, and the Department of Forestry will work with landowners to, to do what's right. Other uncertainties in natural regeneration, again, it's key. If you're um, leaving trees that have very poor potential to survive and be a seed source, you, the likely that this is not going to be approved as natural regeneration. So it's really important uh, there's a little bit of a sacrifice not to harvest every green tree but to leave some for the future stand that you want to grow. And again, this uncertainty about the cone crop, uh, that's, uh, that could be a real pickle. Forest conversions, it's, uh, there's an uncertainty of the process for other agencies reviewing and approving uh, your conversion. Um, this uh, lower uh, slide here shows a wildlife food plot uh, or a wildlife habitat conservation program that um, it's, uh, it's on the books, it's something that can be used, but the capacity for Oregon Department of Forest, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is limited. This is one of these unfunded programs. Uh, the local district would be the ones to work with there to see if that's a, a viable option. There, um, some example would be in Douglas County, uh, retaining or cultivating oak savannas or uh, oak woodlands. Okay, so we're coming up to my last slide here. Uh, this is uh, Martin Luther. He provides a great uh, perspective on life. He says, even if I knew that the world would go to pieces tomorrow, I would still plant an apple tree. So I want to leave it there. There's opportunities for questions now and uh, for Max or me. And if you'd like to further help, uh, again, care to have these links and information, Oregon GOV Forest Lab ODF. So I'll leave it there. I think Carrie's going to monitor or facilitate the questions. That's right. Thank you so much, Keith and Max, for those great presentations. We're going to just jump right ahead to Glenn's presentation. Please know that your question uh, into the Q&A box are actually being answered by some of us behind the scenes. So if you asked a question, uh, go ahead and, and check that in the Q&A. 
Um, we'll roll into a, another Q&A at 4.10 where we'll try to take some of those questions live as well as uh, we'll continue to answer those questions in the background as our presenters are presenting. No worries if you don't wanna distract yourself by looking at those answers. I will provide those in an email after this webinar. So Glenn, take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, Carrie, can you hear me? I sure can. All right, well, hello everybody. Um, thanks for being here and uh, it's uh, my turn and I'm, we've got a lot of us lined up here, but I'm gonna talk to you about uh, basic steps for successful reforestation. And let me get it started there. Uh, so I'm your extension forester in Clackamas and Marion County and Hood River County. Uh, and so my territory uh, has suffered a lot of fire this last Labor Day firestorm. So one example here, looking up the Molala River drainage in Clackamas County. So uh, clearly there's gonna be a lot of questions about reforestation uh, for many landowners. And, you know, normally we, we have a lot of information and a lot of programs every year. We do a, a reforestation program, usually with a couple hours of indoor um, class and discussion, and then we go out in the field. Uh, and, uh, but this year, you know, is, is quite different. First, we have obviously COVID and, and looking at remote teaching for a while. Uh, but then in, in the case of fire, you know, when we start covering the basic steps to reforestation, um, normally you're planning ahead for this. And in the case of fire, we didn't plan this. Uh, so we're already uh, feeling behind. And I think one thing to do is all of us take a deep breath and give ourselves time. Uh, there's just so much to deal with here post fire with all of the damage and the losses that we've suffered. Um, in my case, I did evacuate, but I, the fire came within a mile, uh, but we didn't lose anything, but I've been out seeing a lot of uh, what's going on uh, for those of you that did. So, you know, here's the basic steps that we like to cover in our, our reforestation uh, programs. And, you know, all of you out there may be, you know, quite a spectrum of experience uh, from none to a lot. So we want you to be able to step in and, you know, at whatever stage you're at, get the help you need. Uh, but I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking really about the special circumstances of this fire, uh, post-fire regeneration situation. We're not going to necessarily go into a lot of detail in the, in the short time I have on all the steps. Um, because really that starting point that Max sort of set us up for is you, you're in a position where you have to decide, you know, where are you in the spectrum, uh, evaluating your situation after fire, uh, thinking about, you know, whether it's going to be a let nature take its course or active reforestation situation. Um, I'm going to focus more on the active end uh, with what I'm going to talk about uh, in terms of planting or interplanting. Um, so again, you know, planning is usually the first thing. And uh, for all the years of experience we've had, you know, one of the main things that goes wrong is that people, you know, didn't, weren't able to uh, cover all the bases. You know, one of the things we look at is a checklist, uh, as Carrie mentioned, for the post-fire situation. And then, of course, reforestation planning, you know, there's a serious checklist of all the things that you want to uh, plan for in order to be successful. So here we are. Uh, we didn't plan for the fire. So the starting point is really this assessment. And I don't know how far along you are in that, but where do you need reforestation? And with what Max was talking about, you know, the different levels of recovery that might occur naturally and where your priorities are for planting trees, uh, you may still need some time to figure that out. And once you've done that, then in those areas that you want to plant, you can start down the process of the checklist of getting to know, you know, what that site is like, uh, what environment those seedlings will be in, uh, kind of the, the management situation and the, the constraints you might have depending on access for you and equipment. Uh, and then of course, prescribe your operation and order your seedlings. Uh, so we'll be talking about some of these things, particularly in the, the focus on this fire situation, because what I'm seeing already, uh, what Keith talked about and talking with uh, some of the larger landowners, they're already looking at five years at least to um, be able to do the reforestation that they would like to do. Uh, with this unexpected amount of acres. I and mean, we're talking about perhaps as much as 380,000 acres of private land uh, that's been affected by these fires. So if you do not already have uh, a contractor and seedlings lined up, the contractor perhaps for salvage logging or treatment, uh, and then the seedlings to plant soon, uh, it could be a while before you're able to get those uh, because we know already there's going to be a shortage of both seedlings and contractors, and it's going to take longer. Uh, so uh, with that, I think 
giving yourself the time, depending on where you're at in this. If you if you do have what you need already, you're ready to go. Uh, you need help. Certainly, uh, we're here uh, with Oregon Department of Forestry to help with your immediate questions. But for those of you that are going to be more on a you know two to five year time frame, you know this is a good time to look for the help you need to assess the situation, uh, and also. Uh, seeing what happens, seeing how the vegetation recovers, seeing how your trees do that may have been damaged but not killed, and also planning. So I'm going to you know, refer you to some of the resources coming up. Uh, Steve Fitzgerald is going to be teaching a, a 90 minute session on reforestation and cover the, the basics after harvest and after wildfire uh, December 1st, part of our Tree School online uh, webinar series, uh, and direct you to the resources like the Successful Reforestation Overview publication. Uh, we also just redid our, um, you know, Selecting and Buying Quality Tree Seedlings publication that has a lot of great information. Um, so those are resources I direct you to that Carrie will put online uh, for access after this. Uh, because we really, we do see, you know, at the, the big picture level with the forestry agencies, all of us looking at, well, how big is the need going to be and what will it take, you know, to provide uh, what's needed uh, with a million acres burned and again, that larger acre to private uh, land, 380,000 acres estimated, you know, how many seedlings are needed and what species and what seed sources. Uh, I'll talk a bit about that because deciding where to get your seed and your seedlings and what what species and even the genetic origins of those is going to be important. Uh, are we going to collect it from the wild trees uh, or are we going to use some of the uh, stocks of seeds that are available from seed orchards and who's going to grow those? What's the nursery capacity? And so we're really just getting our heads around this uh, kind of at the statewide or the region wide level uh, in order to provide you, you know, with the seedlings that you'll need. So at the same time that, that we're trying to figure that out and seeing just how you know, big the, uh, the demand is gonna be and where we're gonna grow them, uh, you know, this is time for you to make sure you know your land. Uh, so you've decided you're going to uh, intervene. You're gonna take a, some action here to, to replant or to um, even encourage natural regeneration. Uh, make sure you know your soils and take advantage of soils maps and consultants you know, with the Natural Resource Conservation Service or Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, but most of you, I would assume you walk your land, you know some of the topography, the places that are, you know, the high spots, the low spots, the wet spots, the dry spots. Uh, are you going to be going into the sun or the shade? Uh, do you have some disease areas? Uh, what's the, the, the deer herd like or the wildlife, uh, you know, damage hazards? So that's something you want to be doing at the same time that we're figuring out, you know, how many trees and, and where and what. And of course, across, you know, the diverse uh, topography or forest types that you may have, you know, that, that may take some doing to, to be familiar with that. And after it's burned, you know, it's a whole different scenario. I like to see this green landscape for a change uh, after looking at all the burned areas, uh, but figuring out what was there before it burned, you know, it's, it may be part of that if you didn't know it already. So, you know, then just starting on some of the basics here, uh, choosing the right species, you know, Douglas fir is, um, um, suitable for many areas across Oregon, especially Western Oregon, uh, but each tree species, Douglas fir included, is adapted to certain kinds of conditions and, you know, knowing uh, where they're going to be suitable and where they're not, you know, is really a key to deciding what to plant and, and seedlings to get. And again, I'll refer to this publication that was just recently updated, uh, worked with Amy Grotta and Max Bennett to update this last year. Um, so it's a good resource uh, and it, for example, it has um, some of these, you know, tables showing the different species and their tolerances, you know, their environmental niche that they would grow in. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but that's what you would want to study and make sure that you're looking at the kinds of species available. You know, Douglas fir that doesn't tolerate shade all that well, uh, but it's got good growth rate, moderately tolerant of heat and drought. But what if you have a wet site? What if you have a dry site? Um, you know, and particularly more that kind of a microsite level across your land um, where these different species would be suitable. And also what's on your list? What, what are your goals? What kind of forest do you want? A key aspect of this, one that we're, that we're really gonna have to focus on is not just the species, but the, the seed source, where the parent trees live because local adaptation, uh, particularly with Douglas fir, the most abundant tree in Western Oregon, um, these seed zones here show the areas where within which we think, you know, that Douglas fir 
parent tree, uh, the offspring are going to be locally adapted to the climate and the topography in that area. We used to have about 36 seed zones. We're down to about 16. Uh, when you order seedlings for Douglas fir in this example, you, you would normally order them from this local seed zone. Otherwise, they might not be adapted to the local climate because Douglas fir is a bit of a specialist. Now, other species like red cedar are less of a specialist, western white pine. So kind of knowing, uh, again, your, your choice of species, but also then where are they coming from and what, what elevation zone and what geographic zone. Now, there's a, another little twist in this in that um, when I consult with the forest scientists, the genetic, geneticists and the climate scientists, you know, this quote that I got from, from one of our experts in this, uh, from Glenn Howe and, and Brad St. Clair at OSU, is they've basically said the current populations of trees are not, may not be adapted to the future climates. They're expected to be poorly adapted in, in some cases. Um, and so this whole question of the seed zone then is, is, a, is a moving target. And so we're just now thinking about, would we be taking seeds from further south or lower level lower elevations uh, and moving them a little further north or up in elevation, uh, something we would call assisted migration. And uh, frankly, we're not quite ready to do that. They are doing that in Canada, uh, where they've seen a lot more severe uh, changes in climate. Uh, so that's another thing that we're thinking about, but we don't have uh, good uh, science-based guidance just yet. Um, as an example, you know, one of the projections of the future range of Douglas fir shows, you know, under some model climate futures that, you know, there's some areas in yellow where Doug fir may not be suitable anymore um, where it used to live. And then there's areas in blue where it would become suitable where it isn't now. Um, but again, back to what we have to look at is within the, the seed zone within the species of Douglas fir. Um, if you move trees from further south to further north, this picture on the right, moving a California seed source up into Oregon, you know, in the near future, they may not be adapted to a cooler, moister climate. So there's that kind of moving target that the scientists are struggling with what recommendations they might make. Uh, this scene on the left is showing Douglas fir from different locations from California to Canada planted on one site in Oregon, and some do very well because they're locally adapted and others from further away aren't adapted to that local climate. So it's an example that we, we know a lot about how species are adapted but we're, we're scratching our heads a bit about how to deal with climate change. So right now, our main tool is the uh, current seed zones, which are actually uh, fairly broad for Douglas fir in this example. And when you order trees uh, for your species, you would be uh, choosing them from these seed zones. But in the future, we're looking at climate-based seed, seed deployment, as we call it, um, and a seed zone matcher tool. So some of the, the Pacific Northwest uh, Tree Improvement Research Co-op scientists are working on coming up with something like that that may start giving us tools to adjust for climate change. So when it comes to time to order seedlings, uh, you're looking at the, uh, you know, there's 27 nurseries that are major forest tree growers. And normally we'd be ordering two years in advance uh, from these nurseries, uh, but they're still often the ones we're gonna go back to and maybe we'll be having to see more nursery capacity. Uh, but when it comes time to order, uh, it will be you know important to, to make those choices and species and seed zone and order those trees from the nurseries. And when it comes time to actually looking at the kind of tree you grow after you've decided what species and, and what seed source, uh, is it gonna be a small tree or a little tree? Is it gonna be a, a one-year-old container uh, grown plug like the one on the far left? Uh, our standard tree that we would plant would be like a two-year-old bare root seedling uh, like the middle right. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but that's another choice that you'd have to make. And in fact, a one-year-old seedling might be one of the stop gaps to uh, catch up on the backlog of seedling availability, but we generally prefer a more robust, a larger two-year-old seedling. And then as you're thinking about, um, you know, what might you be up against, what might the challenges be? For decades of experience, what causes reforestation failure? There's, a, there's those things on the checklist, the site preparation, uh, if the seedling stock was not really healthy to start with, or if it was healthy to start with, but you, you mishandled it, uh, let it warm up uh, too long out of the cooler, um, or if it then the worst case uh, or the most common cause of failure, competing vegetation that overwhelms our seedlings in the first few years, uh, or animal damage and depredations, you know, from a, a herd of deer that happens to camp out where you're trying to grow your seedlings or many other uh, animals. 
Uh, here's a four-year-old Douglas fir seedling that just isn't thriving. Um, and it had the combination of a lot of competing herbaceous vegetation and it was planted too deep. Uh, so there's an example of you know, things that can go wrong that you wanna be planning uh, to avoid. And that big one about uh, site preparation and the management of competing vegetation, uh, there's a lot to look at there in, in looking at your site. Of course, fire in this case is going to have provided some site preparation, uh, reforestation after fire. And then there are the other tools you might consider uh, chemical or mechanical or, or combinations, again, to meet your conditions and your objectives. Uh, we'd like it if we had the trees to plant right away after fire, um, as in this case, and because they're, the site is pretty well prepared and trees often do quite well when they're in the ground in a hurry after fires. Uh, in this case, you wanna guess what was growing here in the foreground, Himalayan blackberry. Uh, that's kind of a, a nice sight to see that it's all gone. But, and if we could plant this right away and then uh, manage the, uh, the blackberry as the seedlings are growing in the future, that would be nice. Uh, what about this situation similar to what um, we were talking about earlier with you know 15 year old uh, stand that was killed, it's not gonna be salvaged. Um, yes, you could plant underneath it and put up with some losses as these, uh, these fire killed trees fall apart a bit, um, or you could decide to, you know, site prep this and, and uh, maybe masticate all of the, the, uh, the young trees here first. So those are some things to think about and look at what the cost might be. And a site like this that, uh, what if you're coming into a site, you know, four years or something afterwards and you wanted to interplant, you know, managing this vegetation uh, to make sure that seedlings that are coming up in here along with natural regeneration, you know, would have a good chance. So those are all kind of the site prep and vegetation management challenges you might see. Are you going to be coming into something like this, you know, with several years of uh, blackberries and brush that you have to deal with? Can you can you do this with manual cutting alone, which some people do? Uh, you can. It's just an awful lot of work repeatedly. Um, if you choose to use herbicides, we have a lot of uh, experience and guidance with how you would use herbicides to manage vegetation. And it really starts with knowing exactly what vegetation you're trying to manage and how to target that. Um, and do it properly. And some folks, uh, you know, using uh, aerial applications on larger acreages. And good old uh, mechanical treatments, which still might be important, especially with, um, you know, some of the residual brush or burned area, uh, you know, young trees and brush that were burned but not consumed. And so you've got a lot of material you might want to uh, get back down on the ground. Or again, if Himalayan blackberry or other brush is really up and you just can't get at it without some kind of mechanical um, treatment like this, you know, these are all tools in the box uh, and you kind of decide which, which are available to you. Um, other ways to manage weeds, you know, with mulches or weed control fabric, um, you know, those are all in the toolbox, um, depending on your access and your, the scale of your operation. And, and of course, then, you know, understanding the, uh, the animals there, the wildlife, we often have wildlife habitat as a goal, but wildlife uh, damage is a, is a key threat to our reforestation um, and deer and elk often primary top of the list as an example with, with these tubes that we put around seedlings and I'm nice glad to see this nice red cedar coming out of this tube uh, you know in, in three or four years but understanding you know what your wildlife populations and threats might be is really an important aspect of planning ahead. So really, I want to encourage you, you know, wherever you are in your learning process, um, you know, this is just getting started here. But if, if you're going to have the time uh, to plan for this unplanned event, um, take the time that's necessary to, you know, to look at the checklist and to plan things carefully. And it really is going to start with this assessment of what you really need in the burned areas. And you may not know that right now. You may need to see how things develop, which trees actually do die from the fire damage. Um, and what's coming back. Uh, seek that disaster related assistance where needed because there's a lot of folks that have different needs in different places and you may have hazard trees and other things. And there's quite a few different programs and you'll hear about those with our next speakers uh, for that. And then when you settle into the basics, the more familiar uh, territory for planting reforestation, you know, understanding your environment, picking the right species and the seed sources, um, you know, perhaps getting a little time to get a handle on this uh, matching seed sources for climate change, for instance, might be something that comes up over the next, you know, several years. Um, ordering your seedlings, figuring out where to get in line and get in the pipeline so you do have those trees coming. 
and then of course preparing your site and handling your trees appropriately. And there's a lot more details to this that, that I hope you would you know sign up for some future programs and someday hopefully we'll get back out into in-person instruction on this. So really that's my uh, my short view of this and there's uh, need to have time for questions here, Carrie. So I'm ready to relinquish the stage here. Great, awesome job. Thank you so much, Glenn. Uh, really informative. Let's go ahead and take some questions. Again, working in the background has been this team of presenters and panelists uh, answering your questions. If you've asked a question and don't hear it uh, you know, presented out loud, go ahead and check the Q&A. I'll also be providing those uh, answers to you uh, via email after this webinar presentation. But there are a couple questions left in the chat box for us. So let's see here. Um, what do you think of hand or aerial seating? OK, I'll start on that one. Um, it's a very uh, low uh, success rate. It certainly can work, um, but in uh, and it's been tried uh, and used in, in different situations and different uh, ecosystems. Um, but in general, there's a lot of uh, risks. I mean, so if you think about a pound of seed, a handful of seed, and, and the probability of one of those seeds becoming a tree, uh, it can be very low with the predation by insects um, and um, rodents and birds, um, and also getting the right conditions, you know, where those seeds land. So. It is something that has been used, but it's really a pretty risky um, approach. I don't know if any of the other foresters have a, um, a take on that. But for, I'm talking about for our major you know, conifer or hardwood trees, um, it certainly can work with you know, other species like you know, grasses and herbs and things. Right. And so Glenn, somebody put in the, the Q&A here that just as a FYI, Washington County Master Gardeners has a propagation team and that they might be willing to help take on a project. Yeah, you know, we're actually meeting next week to just look at what is the need and what is the nursery capacity and what does it take to grow the seedlings that people need. Um, and we may be needing to get creative and actually woodland owners and uh, you know gardeners and tree farmers, they are very creative. Uh, I was looking at the edge of my forest where I did some, uh, some harvesting and some thinning and I probably have several thousand young Douglas fir coming up at the edge of my forest that I wasn't planning uh, on. And I'm thinking about transplanting this to my mm -hmm. transplant bed just to beef up my capacity because I do need a couple thousand trees this year. So there's a lot of uh, maybe creative ways at a smaller scale that we can help meet the need. That's great. And to help, uh, you know, have us understand a little bit better, you know, if you, if you need seedlings or if you are having luck getting seedlings, please be sure to fill out the survey at the end of this webinar. When you close down the webinar, a survey box will pop up and we've asked a couple of those questions. That information really helps inform um, moving forward on some of these things. So please do that. Another question for you, Glenn, or the team. Our small site is on a high bank above the Little North Santiam River, about 10 miles from Opal Creek. Most of the duff was burned off the ground and we are left with many rocky soils. Yes, you know, I was just out with uh, my colleague Brad with her Robinson looking at sites where it looks like nothing but rock. We didn't realize until the duff burn that there was so much rock. And yet, you know, the, the trees actually do come back in those rocky sites. Uh, so one thing that happens is that the little, the gravel actually catches those, those seed and, and they fall in between the cracks. And so it actually gives them a, a, a place to germinate. So even though it's rocky, it doesn't mean that natural seeding won't uh, take hold, but it is difficult to plant. And sometimes you need, um, you know, a strong uh, steel bar or a dibble to plant into, and also uh, rocky soils maybe hold less moisture, uh, even though the roots can get down between the rocks and get moisture over time. So you may need more weed control. So specialized tools, uh, maybe better early weed control uh, for planted seedlings may be what you need. But there's been a good amount of success planting rocky sites, and actually Max and others in Southern Oregon have even more experience with that. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let's see here. Um, so where do we find out information on the wildlife habitat food plot? What types of vegetation and info on the tax deferral? Is okay, that, good question. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. one thing I was going to say on the rocky sites, and Max, you might chime in, 
I think planting some of the plug seedlings and container seedlings may be uh, something that uh, is a strategy. Would you say something about that, Max? Sure. I mean, those are obviously, you know, getting a bare root seedling into a 2-0 or, or bigger into a rocky ground is going to be mighty tough. So a smaller seedling is, will, will just be easier to easier to do in those rocky or ravelly, ravelly sites. So if you can get a hold of plug seedlings or like you said, even uh, grow your own, then that, that could be an option. Okay. And so I think, then, um, go ahead. Somewhere in the chat resources, there was a reference that Daniel made to uh, how to grow your own seedlings. So that might be a, that might be something you want to refer to. Then, of course, Glenn was talking about transplanting seedlings from your site that have regenerated naturally, and that and that uh, just to expand a little bit on that, that certainly is an option for folks. Um, you know, this is something that all of the usual precautions around the timing of it and careful uh, care and handling of the seedlings, all those apply. So it's something that you want to do in the winter and, and make sure you protect the root systems of those seedlings that you're transplanting. And, and what I've found uh, is that if you have a fairly loose soil, a nice loamy soil, it's easy to um, it's easy to get those up and move them. But if you have uh, other sites, rocky sites, the root systems are going this way and that way, and it can be difficult to get those out without um, damaging the root system. So really, where is your seed bed is, is, is a pretty critical consideration. Yeah, we apply the same grading standards for, you know, undamaged healthy seedlings, uh, you know, when we lift them from the ground. And so if they if the roots all break when you're lifting them, then that's not a good one to plant. What were those other questions, Carrie? Yeah, so where do we find out uh, more information about that wildlife habitat food plot? Okay, I think that's one for Keith. Yeah, I think that's a key. Actually, I suggest Nate uh, weigh in on that one. Sure. Um, I, I was trying to... Um, I guess I never introduced myself. Uh, Nate Agelsoff, I'm also working Department of Forestry. Um, we do have uh, some of the latest updates posted on our external page. I'm going to maybe just copy that link right into the Q&A box um, as, as for kind of the latest and greatest. And then uh, uh, we'll be publishing. You know, there was another question that came in that was similar to that. And we'll be uh, working on ongoing guidance. But uh, what I would say is as far as the target vegetation, that has been a uh, pretty heavy lift because it is extremely situational. Uh, when we um, looked to implement some of that uh, rule language, um, we elected to try to, it had to be focused on uh, forage. And, and um, as I think Keith hit on pretty well in his presentation, um, you know, contributing to the nutrition of your, uh, the, the wildlife that you're intending to attract, but that uh, list of, um, Targeted wildlife can be, uh, you know, ungulates, birds, um, uh, pollinators, uh, you know, a, a number of different things. And so, what is a, a good fit is extremely situational. And and uh, and I also heard the the plan for alternate practice um, and that uh, thrown out in Keith's presentation. And that is uh, the tool for um, implementing a number of things. And, and wildlife food plots would be an example of that also. Great, and, and so Nate, if you wouldn't mind putting that link into the chat box, that would be great so people can refer to that. Um, thank you for that. Again, Nate with the Oregon Department of Forestry. I also wanna take a moment to introduce uh, Daniel Lavelle. He's uh, Oregon State University Extension State Fire Specialist. He's been answering a lot of your questions in the background. Um, I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to Daniel. He's online with us today as well. Um, so it was suggested that I top the large trees that have been fire burned and then plant below. What is your feedback on that idea? Well, topping a tree is, is, a, is abhorrent to a forester and we normally, or an arborist, we normally wouldn't want to top a tree. Obviously it's maybe an emergency situation to reduce hazard. Um, so aside from the hazard issue, topping a tree is not good for the that tree, but I'm assuming maybe these are uh, damaged trees anyway. Um, 
So hazard tree aside, um, you know, what you plant under the tree and its prospects, it's going to depend on, you know, just how much shade it's getting. So it's going to depend on assessing, you know, what are those conditions uh, on the ground and the vegetation, and then how much shade or cover is it getting from the overhead trees. Um, you know, the question of whether the trees falling down, the fire killed trees or a top tree that falls down, you know, how that damages the trees that you might plant underneath and how hard to work to get the uh, burned trees out of the way. Uh, you know, that's kind of an open question, but actually, you know, talking to some foresters, planting trees underneath damaged trees or top trees that may fall down someday, you know, it's a reasonably um, small uh, damage, uh, you know, from the, you know, the falling uh, trees and, and branches and such. And so, you know, if you only had maybe 20% losses from stuff falling down, I hope that gets at the question, but um, as long as the environment is reasonably good for soils, vegetation, and, and enough light, uh, if it's shady, then you might be needing to plant a shade tolerant tree. Great. Um, Glenn, where can we get information on what type of chemicals to use around new trees, particularly for blackberries? Yeah, so you, you can just work through your local extension forester. Um, you know, we have uh, guidelines and, and resources to help you. Uh, it does start with, you know, what species of seedling or what species of tree you're talking about because, uh, you know, the different major species, Douglas fir and cedar and hemlock, pine, um, grand fir, et cetera, you know, they all have different uh, sensitivities. And so we can help um, match up your target weeds, what might work on those and how to protect your trees. Um, in general, uh, the first year after planting, even some of the conifers are maybe more sensitive in some cases to uh, herbicide damage, for example, um, as opposed to an established uh, seedling. Uh, so those are details we can help you with. Fantastic. Get your questions into the Q&A box. Um, I can see that Nate has posted that resource for the basics on wildlife food plots. Uh, so go ahead and open that if you're interested. Another question here uh, for y'all, once you order seedlings and receive them, how long do you have to plant them and care for them in the meantime? So the general rule is to keep the seedlings, you know, close to freezing. Uh, usually we store seedlings in the cooler. Um, some cases, uh, seedlings are actually stored in the freezer and then thawed out uh, a week or so prior to planting. But once you've got your trees delivered and generally they're in bags or boxes that have been in a cooler, uh, just a couple of degrees above freezing, you wanna keep them cool until planting. Um, and it varies a bit by species as soon as possible uh, to get them in the ground is good. Uh, generally storing them for a week or two in the cooler is not a problem. Uh, but um, I had experience with Western red cedar and particularly being much more you know, sensitive to storage. Uh, you've got to make sure that the, uh, they're well aerated and they're not too moist and getting moldy in the cooler. So the, the storage conditions can be very important. You can have a lot of de degradation of seedlings, especially if they're warmed up or if they're kept in an area without good ventilation. So best case is to plant, leave them in the cooler at the uh, nursery and then get them out and plant them within a, you know, a fairly short time. But I, I have succeeded in storing seedlings for up to a month with proper mm -hmm. cooler storage. Um, there may be some minor degradation, but you know we've done okay with that. But some species are more sensitive than others. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Glenn. Um, where uh, does someone find references on licensed herbicide applicators? Uh, we have a variety. We have a, a resource called the Oregon Forest Industry Directory. Um, which actually that's another one we'll want to post on the site. Um, it's a bit of a, a search uh, process through that, but you can look for uh, pesticide applicators in that. Also uh, in my county, for example, we have lists. They're not necessarily complete or current of um, contractors who, you know, they describe their services, including uh, whether or not they're licensed. Um, so probably multiple resources through your extension forestry and also the Department of Forestry, I believe, has lists in, in all their district offices of um, contractors who also can apply pesticides. Great. Well, we've cleared out the Q&A box, but I'm just going to give a couple more minutes for people to add more questions in. While I'm pausing for that, I just I want to let you know um, next week we'll take a, a small break from these uh, post-fire webinar uh, series and we'll come back November 5th 
uh, for a presentation on tax considerations for those impacted by wildfire or other natural disasters. Um, Tammy tells me that, oops, this webinar will cover the information you will need to handle your taxes after the fires. Uh, we will talk about possibilities for deducting losses, how to determine the amount of loss, and reconstructing your basis in the trees. Some people may need to report a gain from the salvage of the timber, or you may be considering whether you even want to replant after harvest or salvage from the timber. Um, so we will want to talk about how uh, that decision can impact your property taxes here in Oregon. So join us November 5th from three to five for that uh, tax webinar. Um, and then we got a message here from Nicole who says, feel free to contact your local soil and water conservation district to connect with your local Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, contact for questions about enrolling in the wildlife habitat conservation and management tax deferral program. Okay. Yeah, that's a real good one because there are many, I get many calls from landowners that, um, you know, they have a situation where it's not that great for growing trees and particularly maybe after fire, there's some areas that you might want to manage for habitat. So in addition to the food plots, there is this program that Nicole referred to. As Keith said, unfortunately, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, you know, sometimes doesn't have the staffing to administer it. But it sounds like from what Nicole is saying is that there are still are opportunities there. And, and that could be a real good fit for landowners in just certain you know, parts of their property. Um, I wanted to say just to uh, reiterate that get a hold of your Department of Forestry Stewardship Forester because they have a lot of great uh, resources. I know Keith would have said that, but since I'm on the mic, um, you know, they are your resource for technical assistance about getting the work done. They're going to be pretty busy after the fire, but they're still there uh, for some of this technical assistance. And then also your extension forester. So you ought to have both of us in your, in your contact list and um, in your county. Great. This is a great question here, Glenn. Often it seems the information in these webinars is focused on the areas burned in the state that are not on the coast. What are the differences to consider? Uh, you mean on the east side? Uh, is that what they're talking about, not on the coast? So. I think this is somebody who's experienced a fire on the, on the coast area. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, okay. What are, what are the differences? Yeah. We've been talking um, about? Well, there's, I mean, there's, I used to work on the coast out on the North Coast. Um, and even though fire is rare, it does happen. And more often than people realize, because uh, a lot of those forests were regenerated from fires as well. But, um, you know, there's certain aspects of it being a more, actually in a more forgiving environment in terms of moisture stress. So your seedlings can often survive a little better under competition for moisture than they would in the drier parts of the state. But on the other hand, you're, it's a jungle out there and the vegetation grows that much faster and the shrubs uh, overtop your seedlings and turn the lights out uh, even more so than they do inland. So uh, really it becomes more a man managing for more light, making sure light is available and the moisture uh, limits are a little less critical there on the coast. So that's one aspect of, of reforestation for sure. Great. And call your extension forester on the coast because we have that covered. We do. Great. So thank you so much, Glenn, for your presentation. I think we're going to transition now and uh, ask our agency partners, Brett Harris and Heather Medina, uh, to uh, give a presentation. And I don't know if Brett's going first or Heather is going first, um, but the stage is yours when you're ready. I think I'm going first. Great. <clears throat> so. Uh, Brett Harris, Farm Service Agency. I'm the County Executive Director for FSA for Coos Curry, Douglas, Jackson, and Josephine Counties. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is uh, some basic eligibility stuff for USDA programs. Um, if you have been participating in some of our programs, you're already in the system, and so some of these things won't apply to you. If you have not participated in a USDA program, either FSA or uh, NRCS, then we need some basic information to get you in our system. So we have a couple of 
documents that we use to do that. Um, an AD 2047 form is the basic information, name, address, contact info, uh, social security number or tax ID number, so we can put you in the system. Um, and then there's some other basic eligibility forms for, uh, depending on the program, adjusted gross income, uh, certification of compliance with highly erodible land and wetland, uh, conservation, and uh, basic payment limitation documentation that would be required for programs under either agency. And I will make sure that links for that are available on the, on the website also. Um, and then the main program um, that FSA would have that would deal with a forestry related disaster is the Emergency Forest Restoration Program, our Alphabet Soup EFRP. Um, and that uh, provides a cost share of up to 75% of cost not to exceed our program maximums. Um, a, a basic cost that it would take to restore the forest land to its pre-fire condition. Um, and we can do things like debris removal, uh, site prep, planting materials, uh, labor, uh, roads and fire lanes to a certain extent, um, fencing if it's necessary to protect this new plantation, tree shelters, tree tubes, a uh, few wildlife uh, enhancements are also possible. <clears throat> and uh, cost share would be limited to 500,000 per person or legal entity under that program from FSA. Um, so again, I'll make sure that the links for these program fact sheets and other FSA program information is links are on the website. Um, the, the thing to remember about specifically FSA programs is that we have to request authority for a sign up and then announce that sign up before we can actually take applications. Uh, and I think Heather's going to talk about NRCS programs, which are going to be a little bit ahead of us on that curve, but we'll still need FSA does the eligibility documentation, if you will, for both agencies. So we need to get that information in the system. Um, I don't really know, have anything other specific to talk about um, with FSA programs until we have that, um, till we actually have the, the sign up period for the EFRP. But I would encourage that Folks, if you have damaged lands that you think you might be interested in a USDA program, uh, key things would be take documentation, uh, both written and especially pictures of the damage. If you have pictures of the same areas from before the fire, those are helpful too. So we can establish the level of damage and then that helps us uh, certify things that we could do to assist the producers. So that's about all I have. Maybe Heather wants to jump in or I'd that's be great. certainly willing to take questions. Yeah, let's let Heather jump in, I think. And then um, once Heather's done, we'll, uh, we'll open it up for questions. And you're in mute, Heather. Let me share my screen and get the presentation going. Sure thing. Let's see, oops. I'm trying to move this up. All right, can you see that? We sure can, looks great. All right, very good. Hello, my name is Heather Medina. So said I'm a basin team leader. My office is in Tangent. I cover the Central Coast, Upper Willamette, and Southwestern Oregon. 
I today I'll be speaking on behalf of Oregon NRCS and we'll be discussing all of um, our assistance that is going on currently throughout the whole state. So thank you all for calling in today. We have a really good turnout and it's it's good to see um, people from the coast, from Eastern Oregon, all over Oregon attending today. And so our main program that we are having um, assistance funding through is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Currently, we are having a sign up for our emergency program and that's for private landowners. And that is for the landowners that were affected by the wildfire. <clears throat> As Brett had stated, we work directly with our sister agency, Farm Service Agency. And any landowners that need to, um, that are interested in our programs, really need to um, work with NRCS and create some farm records with FSA. So that is really important. And in a little bit before that, I just really wanted to say thank you to, um, to the previous presenters. I think doing the, the farm planning is really important or, or having a plan of, of their site and one of the documents that was shared in the chat earlier is um, Dan Levine has, and NRCS, our state forester, has been um, talking about the after the fire checklist. That is a great tool to bring to Farm Service Agency, to NRCS. It really documents what you're seeing on your property. We are both, both agencies are very taxed right now and um, all the information that you can bring, photos in that checklist would be extremely helpful. So as Brett had stated, there's adjusted gross income that um, there's limitations of the highly erodible land and the wetland um, conservation requirements as well. And if, if somebody were a historically underserved producer, we could receive advance payments on that. And so this is our website for the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, and that is in for Oregon. And eligible producers are agriculture producers, non-industrial private forest lands, tribes, and other interests in agriculture or forestry lands. So all of our information, the Oregon website is going to be your best place to go to um, for information. Here is a map of where Oregon is working on addressing our specific environmental quality incentives program funding. This is a FEMA map with the FMEG fires, the red ones, and that is where we are focusing our emergency fire funding. And so some of the conservation practices that are in our emergency fire funding is really to address erosion, and that is conservation cover, cover crops, woody residue treatment, and that addresses some of the hazardous tree trees and mulching. And our current signup is going on currently, and that will end October 30th, or excuse me, October 30th. And then the next signup for the emergency signup is December 30th. So these are specifically for um, addressing erosion, but as this, um, this webinar is stating about looking into the future, Oregon NRCS recognizes that many of you might not be in a situation right now to address, um, you're worried about homes and other properties, um, other items going on right now. So we definitely are looking in the long term, as many of the speakers had stated, you know, looking at some regeneration, looking for a few years. So we are committed here in Oregon to be helping long term. Each of our um, talking for the specifically for Western Oregon, we are looking at having a conservation implementation strategy for the west side of Oregon that looks at restoration. We are currently in development of that strategy, and that will be for um, both the top of uh, we call it the the north coast and lower Willamette, the lower Willamette on the um, the central coast and southwestern Oregon. And that will be addressing um, tree planning and other suite of practices, such as tree establishment, tree shrub site prep, critical area planning, conservation cover, and herbaceous weed control. Again, we are still currently in that planning process for that um, strategy. And that is specifically for the areas impacted 
in the fire, the FMEG fires, to address um, the restoration. That general equip sign up will be November 20th. So you can always go into your local NRCS office and um, provide, um, talk to them, either if you're interested in the emergency sign up for the erosion control and or for the future restoration. Each of the basins, um, so we have um, also, excuse me, I, I forgot to mention, since we do have some people here from Eastern Oregon, there is a Eastern Oregon fire um, to address those FMEG fires as well. And so um, there's opportunities to address um, that erosion as well. Each county has their own conservation implementation strategy and they might not just be addressing fire, but they would, many of them are addressing forestry concerns. So feel free to contact your local NRCS office and there are many um, different opportunities addressing for forestry. Here is some contact numbers for our offices, which many of them are co-located with NRCS. Some of them are standalone office, so you can feel free to contact that, those numbers right there. And this information will be put on the website as well. Conservation practices um, payments, NRCS um, usually pays those payments. We um, have the least cost practice payment to treat the erosion concerns. Right now we have um, payments um, are at 50% of the estimated costs. And right now we're also having higher payments for up to 75% for historically underserved applicants. Um, let's see if that is all I, that is all I have. And I can put my um, contact not name, email and phone number as well if you have any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Heather. And um, let's see here, just making sure. So I think now we're in a time for Q&A. So if you have questions, um, actually for any of the presenters, um, uh, go ahead and put those into the Q&A box. Heather has just provided her contact information. Again, she's with NRCS. Um, so let's check out what questions we have here. Um, okay, so uh, uh, Nicole lets us know that feel free to contact your local soil and water conservation district to locate your local farm service agency and or your natural resources conservation service contact for these programs. We often coordinate services with these agencies. Thank you so much, Nicole. And I can put that also on the website. Um, and so Steve asks, uh, this is a question for Glenn, what information has been gathered on the status of different wildlife species for the fire? Elk herds, deer, rodent, uh, predators? That's a great question. And I am wondering that myself because I have not heard much about that. Although I was thinking of calling a certain wildlife biologist I know named Fran, who um, uh, has a similar name, but um, I'd really like to know that because when I look at some of these areas that are burned from ridgetop to ridgetop, I, I really worry about what happened you know, to so many wildlife species that are out there. And uh, I'd like to hear some input from Department of Fish and Wildlife and, and wildlife biologists out there. I know it's amazing the animals I have seen in the burned area that found a refuge somewhere. Um, but I, I'd be curious to know, you know, what, what some of the experts think. Mm -hmm. If there's anybody on this call that, that uh, has more information, let us know. Yeah, actually feel free if you do have more information to go ahead and uh, raise your hand and we can see that um, in our little presenter attendee window. So if you have any information on that, feel free to share. Um, Okay, let's see, any other questions for our agency partners related to EQIP or farm service? Um, now's the time, this is a great time. You have those people on the line ready to answer your questions. Um, Heather, can you remind us on those dates for those various um, offerings? Uh, one ended, uh, is it at the end of October? And then again, one starts in December. Can you, can you tell us about those dates again? 
Yes, the emergency signups for equip to address the um, the FMEG fires for um, on the erosion is October 30th and December 30th. Our general equip that we will be addressing the forest uh, fire restoration is November 20th. And we understand that's pretty quick. So each of the basins, um, specifically on the west side of Oregon, will be having another sign up that still is yet to be determined though. Okay, that's helpful. I, I can try to put those on the, the website as well. Any other questions? I have a question and, and an observation. I, we've been getting questions a lot with landowners that have, um, you know, they have a home in a small uh, plot. Uh, they have hazard trees, they have forest trees. Um, wondering about what programs apply to the folks that don't actually have a farm or a, a, a forest, but they have a small lot. Um, and you know, my understanding is that some of the programs don't apply to smaller lots, um, mm -hmm. but certainly through FEMA and other uh, sources. Um, I know the soil and water conservation districts are talking about maybe getting some of the emergency watershed um, you know, funding for that. So what coverage is there in that sort of interface between a farm and a forest and just a resi rural residential lot with, with damaged trees and natural resources? So we do NRCS and FSA, um, but I'll just kind of start with NRCS. We we do work with small um, forestry lands. Um, for example, we've been working in, in southwestern Oregon and Curry County and some sudden oak deaths. So those are small small acreages as well. So anybody that's non-industrial private forest is is eligible. Um, well, I'm talking about like a 50 by 100 foot lot. Uh, not necessarily a small acreage, but less than one acre. Um, they may have an adjacent parcel, but they have a home site on a small lot, and they've been told that certain programs don't apply. So this might clear up, you know, the continuum of you know natural resources from small lots to acreage. Correct, and in yeah, that is a, a smaller lot, so not not necessarily considered non-industrial private forest lands. I know um, one of our district conservationists in Lincoln County has, has mentioned some very similar sites um, as well. So maybe a watershed council or um, a dis SWCD might have some additional funding. Yeah, and FEMA as well is what I've heard. Um, I had one thing I wanted to mention that someone's asking about how long you can store the seedlings. And I talked about storage conditions. It's very important though, if you don't keep the seedlings cool, they don't last very long at all. So I, I've, I don't know that I said that. If you're not able to keep them in the cooler and you just have a bag of seedlings um, and they're gonna warm up above 40 degrees or 50 Don't leave them in the, in the garage for a month and then try to plant them, I think. So yeah, just, just I said something about a month. That's under the very best cooler storage at 34 degrees. So if you're getting the trees out and they're in the open and they might warm up, you got to plant them in a day or so. Just wanted to clarify that. Okay, a couple more questions here. Do they still use 2,4-D to burn ground wood debris before replanting or there or are there alternatives? Um, I guess I can try that. So you're talking about brown and burn. Is that what that is about? Well, they wrote, do they still use, I thought it was 2,4-D or 2,4-D to burn ground wood debris, ground wood debris before yeah, replanting. I'm, I'm not, I mean, 2,4-D is an herbicide that, you know, we mm -hmm. apply to green vegetation. So I'm not, sure what they're referring to. Um, that's not something I would apply, you know, to, to wood. Um, I mean, there is the practice of using herbicides to kill vegetation and then doing some kind of broadcast burning, but that's hardly ever done anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we might've covered part of this, but um, I'll ask it anyway. Right. When does NRCS anticipate the erosion funding contracts will be ready to go. Are early start waivers being considered to get work done as early as this winter or will it more likely uh, need, be next spring or summer? Great question. I see Nicole answer that. And I was wondering which, which office, Nicole, which county she's from. So NRCS is um, accepting early start waivers. So um, you need to work with your local district conservationist 
and your local district conservationist um, will be asking you or the producer, the landowner, they will need to request an early start waiver. That early start waiver gets sent to the um, acting state conservationist, Jason Jeans. And that doesn't guarantee that you're gonna get funded. Um, we do have quite a bit of funding. Um, so we are looking, I'm not exactly sure when our, um, our district conservationists need to create um, the contracts or the agreements and then um, have that process for selecting. Again, we work with farm service agents for eligibility. So I can't give you a date when we're gonna have the contracts ready, but we are working on those early start waivers. So we also do need the cultural resources completed and based on our small suite of practices, that should be pretty easy um, to get done. We're working with our cultural resource specialist and um, he believes everything is, is um, should be good to go under our programmatic. So I would just, Nicole, um, contact your um, Clackamas um, person, your district conservationist that is, and um, have your landowners work with that DC and have them, when they're coming into the office for that application, have them be at that time ready to write that um, waiver if they're asking for that. I know that many of the questions we've been having with extension and with some of the other um, fire meetings, many people are ready to go now, um, but for many NRCS programs and, and FSA, um, we have to have a, a waiver first before um, we can actually start those. Um, and that has to be approved waiver as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, let's see. Yep, no problem, Nicole. So um, we still have time for a Q and A. If you have a question, uh, go ahead and put that in the uh, question and answer box. In the meantime, I'll throw this out to our our presenters and panelists. Anything that uh, you missed in your presentation or that you want to dive a little bit more into while we have just a little bit more time. Um, I'd actually like, if I could, Carrie, I'd like to pose a question to, uh, to I've got a couple of uh, assistance programs questions uh, for, first for Heather and Brett. So th there's the emergency forest restoration program that you talked about, Brett, and then, and then Heather, you talked about this um, new, the, the, the Westwide CIS conservation implementation strategy that will focus on post-fire, uh, you know, restoration stuff. Um, and, and so first question, Heather, I understood you to say, I think that the deadline for that is November 20th, but you'll have another sign up. Is yes, that Max, you heard me correct. Yes, um, the, our first general environmental quality incentives program for the restoration is going to be November 20th. Okay. And then we will also each of those, um, the basins, for example, the lower Willamette North Coast will have an opportunity to have a second sign up and then, um, the area I cover, the Upper Willamette, uh, Central Coast, and Southwestern Oregon will have, we're looking, that would probably be in March sometime, March okay. 20th, March 17th. Right. And and so what's what's the main difference between those two programs, between the e EFRP and, and what you're talking about? Or is, I mean, what are what are the substantive differences? That's great. I think as we are still developing our strategy, so we have some tree planning and conservation cover. So it's, it's very similar. Um, it's, it just depends on, um, again, those would also be able to get a early start waiver as well. Again, that's not guaranteeing any funding, but they're just very similar. And, and sometimes, honestly, um, FSA's programs are a little bit more flexible. So our, our program, EFRP, may be a little bit more flexible, but it takes a little bit longer to get it to get it going. So the, the first program that Heather talked about where you can get like almost immediate action for uh, ground protection, that's something that you can't do with the FSA program. Um, but uh, once once we have the authority to require to you know, take signups, um, then we can certainly look at stuff that needs to be done before you're technically approved. 
uh, early start kind of thing um, for stuff that's necessary to you know protect life property and those kinds of things uh, but we don't know how we don't know how many dollars we have until we see you know what the damage is who's interested in the programs and then request dollars and a sign up authority gotcha. thank you well that has generated some more questions but nate you have a comment so go for it yeah i actually uh, had a couple and i I want to just kind of tag on to what Heather and Brett had said, and the intent is to deliver these um, these two offerings in a very complimentary way. Um, and then we even within Equip, uh, we kind of have a it's a it's a short term, um, you know, immediate, uh, you know, um, kind of a home addiction zone type footprint and scale. Uh, for erosion control and, and the hazard reduction there. And then with, uh, well, and I see furrowed eyebrows, Heather, so reel me in if you think I'm out over my skis here. But, uh, and then there's, um, uh, you know, it, the bigger picture um, to try to address these things at, at, a, at a scale um, over time and in the forest environment more, more generally. And so, um, the hope is that we can kind of deliver these two things. And then also the intended sign-up timeframes, I believe will be relatively similar. So starting um, first part of November, we'll initiate that 60 day uh, EFRP sign-up window if, um, if we can stay on track with that. Um, also, I want to touch on a, a couple of other things. Uh, the there's a couple different uh, planning types that came up, and so we talked about that with with food plots. And Keith mentioned plans for alternate practice, and then there is uh, certainly a planning component that goes along with um, you know delivering uh, conservation practices with the the federal offerings. And so for the audience, I would say um, know that. Uh, the Department of Forestry is, generally speaking, the, the technical service provider at, um, or um, administering agent for, for both the FPA and, um, and some of these assistance programs. And so, um, so that there can be some overlap in, in, in the planning and FPA requirements. And so the close, careful coordination with your, your stewardship forestry at the local level is, is kind of critical to make sure those dots are connected um, the other thing I might mention, uh, for those that have participated in assistance programs in the past, um, to understand that, um, these are, these are cost, cost share programs. So it's an assumed cost, um, some kind of, uh, presumed loss. So it, it in no way should function or could function like, um, like an insurance claim or something like that. It's, um, it's uh, the intent is to, to try to minimize the, uh, the financial burden to try to get some of these lands back into productivity. Um, and then also that um, the, the EQIP and the EFRP uh, function basically like contractual agreements. Um, so if, uh, if for anyone on the line has participated in some kind of um, fuels reduction or something like that uh, in their home ignition zone on, the, on their place, uh, this would be a somewhat different arrangement um, than maybe what you've experienced in the past. So um, simple enough to work through, but uh, it just will look a little differently in practice. And then, and I'll, and I'll stop, um, maybe Brett, if he's still on the line, could touch on fencing just a tad more. That's come up in the past and just to clarify and, and set reasonable expectations um, for eligibility there, my, my previous understanding is that, that it, it had to be a fence that burned. Um, is that correct? Uh, generally, it would have to be a fence that burned unless there was some spe specific reason um, 
that you would have to have a fence to protect the plantation. Normally we would do that with some kind of a tube or tree shelter though. Does that make sense? That's, that's exactly what I was looking for, thank you. Great, Nate, thank you for all that follow-up. That's great. We have a couple more questions in the Q&A uh, that I wanna make sure we get to. Uh, it, there's a question here. It, it sounds like two separate equip pools for post-fire work with NRCS. Can landowners apply for both because there seem to be different practices involved? Then does it make more sense to wait and apply for the second program with the planting option, more, more practices. From us NRCS listening to many of the extension conversations, we understand that many people just really aren't in a position to apply for a, a program right now. They're worrying about things like their homes or things like that. So that's why we wanted to have two different dates, the October 30th and, and December 30th. It's those are covering for the whole state Eastern and Western Oregon looking at erosion specific. And we wanted to have some a small suite of practices that we could get out, out of the door and address erosion, um, not only with uh, the mulching and the critical area seating, but also for putting some hazard, those addressing those hazardous trees um, to um, kind of put, put them down and then have some contouring to address the erosion. People can, and when you're coming into an office, apply for multiple, um, equip programs, um, just contact your, talk to your local district conservationist. Um, having that OSU extension that after the fire checklist is going to be extremely helpful when you're talking to your local NRCS office. So yeah, you can feel free to see um, which ones, having that conversation with your local um, NRCS person is really gonna help you decide which um, fund pool would be working out best for you. Great, thank you so much, Heather. Um, one final question here. Do I understand correctly that if you will apply for NRCS benefits, you cannot salvage log, do erosion mitigation until you receive approval from NRCS? That is very tricky, yes. So for any conservation practices that you want funded through the Farm Bill through to have an agreement with us, First, if you're interested, you can work with your local planner, NRCS planner, and ask for a, a waiver if you want to get started immediately. But knowing with that um, early start waiver, you still may not be guaranteed the funding. And mm -hmm. so you would have all cultural resources, all of our NEPA would need to be completed first. And then your local district conservationist would, would say, okay, you can proceed but um, you might not get funded. And so, I'm sorry, can you go back to the question or it's gone, the question's gone again. Um, uh, I, can, I can find it here. Okay. Um, and so if you really, you can't start anything until, um, unless you have that waiver to start um, anything that you would like funding. I know in some previous webinars and conversations, people wanted to, um, uh, for example, in the McKenzie, they're trying to do some hydro seeding now. Can NRCS pay for it? We have to um, either have an early start waiver or have that agreement in place um, before we can um, um, work with that landowner to get that paid. So if you're going to start work, you have to apply for the early start waiver, which still does not guarantee that you will get that funding. High probability, but not guaranteed. Hey, right, that's important, yeah. Any last minute, anything from the presenters or panelists uh, before we say goodnight? Okay. I, I just wanted to say, I did not cover the emergency watershed program. And I know we've um, been discussing that um, the district conservationist in the Waldport office, we know um, the fire in Lincoln County, um, like Max said, had, had some small acreages. Um, and so if a soil and water conservation district or the local city were interested in applying to be a sponsor to address a group of areas, someone could be a sponsor for the EWP program. So that um, 
if they're interested, let me know and we can work with our state engineer, Molly Dawson, and that emergency watershed program is looking at um, to address um, imminent threat to life or home. Great, Heather, and I'll also add that to uh, the website under the resources for today's webinar. That one's a good one too. Thank you. So, um, well, don't forget to join us next week, uh, actually uh, two weeks, November 5th at three o'clock for uh, Tammy Cushing's presentation on tax considerations for those impacted by wildfire or other natural disasters. Just a huge thank you to the presenters and panelists who provided a lot of great information today. Thank you so much. Um, and to you all, thank you for joining us. We recognize this is a difficult time for so many of you and we appreciate you tuning into these webinars. I've said this before, webinars are just one way we can provide information to you during this time of COVID. We can't necessarily be face-to-face, -face, um, so this is really helpful. This webinar has been recorded feel free to share it out. Uh, and finally, if you have a moment, please tell us what you thought about today's presentation by filling out that very brief survey I mentioned earlier uh, in the webinar. That survey will pop up immediately following uh, you closing out your browser. Um, if you miss it, don't worry, I'll, I'll send it again with information uh, on the webinar, including uh, the recording and um, the resources. That's it, folks. Stay safe, everyone. See you in a couple weeks, and good night.